This video gives an example of a differential dividend growth problem. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephen Haggard. Let's talk about the relationship between dividends and stock prices. We know that the price or value of anything is the expected value of the future cash flows discounted at a rate appropriate to the risk. So what are the future cash flows for stocks? Well, the uh, dividends and then the price when you sell them. And let's assume that we just let the stock go on forever and ever because of course stocks never mature. Then all we're really looking at is the sum of all the present values of all the dividends received over the stock's life. And so that's what we say a stock price should be. The sum of all the present values of all the expected dividends the stock will ever pay. And we've got some simplifying assumptions that we make along the way. We could talk about constant dividends, which is also called zero growth dividends. And that would be how we value preferred stock. And then we've got constant dividend growth. And this is where the dividends grow at a constant rate. And those two can be easily solved using a straight up algebraic equation. And so I would encourage you to watch my video on stock valuation if you would like to know more about those. But then there's a third way that we talk about and it's called differential or supernormal dividend growth. And this is where the dividends grow quickly at first and then revert to a constant dividend growth rate for the rest of all time. Now why might that be the case? Well, what if you had a stock that just started paying dividends? The company might tiptoe into the water and start with a small dividend, but we would expect it to grow fairly quickly, but then eventually they will figure out what is the growth rate that they can maintain long term. Keep in mind that companies hate to cut dividends because doing so will result in a big drop in their stock price. Okay, now there is a slick algebraic way to calculate those other ways, but there is none for this. And so we're going to have to uh, do a little better on that. But the first thing we're going to have to do is actually learn how to read these problems and determine what we're being told. First of all, if you've got D0, uh, we see words like just paid or the last dividend was or recently paid. And if you're given D1, the dividend at time one, it would be the next dividend will be or will pay in one year or plans to pay. And so anything that you see that's in the future less than or equal to one year is D1. And anything you see that is past or present is D0. Now be careful because sometimes they'll say things like this. The company expects to start paying its dividend in year three. And so that means that D0, D1, and D2 are all zero. And the last thing to keep in mind is that we never receive D0 unless we are told otherwise. Okay, so let's review the problem statement here. Uh, first of all, on a finance problem, you always want to look at what is the question. They're asking us to do the expected price of the stock. And what does expected here mean? It just means our estimate. We can't tell for sure what it's going to be. It's our best guess. The stock you're interested in paid a dividend of $2 last year. Now last year is past tense, that tells us this is D0. But we don't get D0. Why are they giving us a D0 then? So we can calculate D1 and so forth. The anticipated growth rate in dividends and earnings is 20% for the next two years before settling down to a constant 5% growth rate. The discount rate is 10%. Discount rate means required return or the rate of return. There are many different names for that, but it's, uh, it's the only rate here that isn't a growth rate, so we're pretty sure that's what it is. And now we're going to calculate the expected price of the stock. So let's talk about the uh, the process for this. We've already discussed this part of it here about new companies and how they pay dividends. And unlike constant dividend growth, we can see that 
in the situation with supernormal division growth, R can be greater than G for short time, short periods of time. Actually, that should be less than G, sorry. R can be less than G. Now, if we look at constant dividends, we see that R must always be greater than G, so the stock price will be positive and not infinite. Here's the bad part. There's no slick algebraic method for solving these. So instead of an equation, what we have is a process. And the first part of that process is to find the individual amounts of the dividends up to the start of constant growth. Now keep in mind, we don't get D0 unless we are told otherwise. Then we're going to find the price of the stock at the start of constant growth. And then we are going to find the present value of these dividends and the stock price. So let's break down this problem. A stock you're interested in paid a dividend of $2 last year. That's $2 at time zero. We don't receive that. The first growth rate that we're told about is 20%. That's G1. Now anytime you're using a growth rate or a required rate of return in a calculation, which we will be doing, you want to use the decimal equivalent, which here is 0 0.20. And then it settles down to a constant 5% growth rate. That would be G2. And once again, we want to put that in a decimal equivalent. And they tell us that the required return is 10%. And so once again, 0 0.10, the decimal equivalent. That's what we want to use in our calculations. And they're asking us, what is P0? But we know that P0 is merely the sum of the expected future cash flows of the stock, and that will be the dividends up to the time of constant dividend growth starting, and the price at that point. Now why the price at that point? Because it represents all of the dividends that go on beyond that point. So the first thing that I always do when I get a problem like this is to draw a picture. And even though I have a PhD in finance, and I've been doing this since before some of you were born, I still draw a picture every time because these things will mess with your head. So here's what we do. They tell us that our dividend at time zero is two. I'm gonna go ahead and draw that in even though we don't receive it. And then they say for the next two years, it grows at 20%. Now, does that mean that we go up to time two or time three? Sometimes people get confused. So here's what I would suggest use the kindergarten method. We start at time zero and say one, two. Now, what if they had given us the dividend at time one? We would have said one, two, and started constant growth at time three. But here, because we started at time zero, we've gone up to time two. And so what we're really gonna need to do is calculate the amount of this dividend, the amount of this dividend, and a price at this point that represents the present value at time two of all these dividends going forward. So let's work through the process. We're going to find the amount of the individual dividends up to the start of constant growth, so that's D1 and D2. Remember, we don't receive D0. Then we're going to find the price at the start of constant growth, and that will be P2. And then we are going to uh, find the present value of all those things and sum those together. So how are we going to calculate the dividends and that future price? Well, D1 is equal to D0 times 1 plus G1. So we are able to calculate D1 knowing that time zero dividend and the growth rate. In fact, we can generalize that as long as we have a period of constant growth dx is equal to dy times one plus g to the x minus y power. x minus y here would be one, and there's a one up there, you just can't see it. So the other thing to keep in mind is that we have uh, p0, our formula says that p0 is equal to d1 divided by r minus g. And we need to, uh, so what we're going to do 
is we're going to move that formula forward and work because we're actually looking for P2. And so what we'll be looking for then is D3. Now at this point we will not have calculated D3, but we can say that it is equal to D2 times 1 plus that second growth rate divide by R minus G2, and that gets us our P2. So using this, we can find D1 uh, from D0. We can find D2 from D1 using this formula here. And then we can find P2 using D2 and these growth rates and the required return. So let's show you the easy way to do this. And by the way, I've been doing this a long time. And I have developed over the years uh, this method and it seems to work every time and it's the least error prone method I have found for doing these problems. So here we go. Here's our TIBA2 plus. I'm going to start off by saying CF second clear work. Why is that important to do? Because the calculator is like a wife. It never forgets. And so you have to clear it out. Now that means the calculator has one benefit that a wife does not and that is you can actually clear it out. Now in the interest of the ladies out there I will say this. Gentlemen, if we would stop doing stupid stuff they wouldn't have things to remember about us. Okay, so here we go. Now we said that we don't get anything at time zero. So there is C of zero is equal to zero. And then we go down to C zero one. Now what are we getting at time one? Let's go back and look. And we have a time zero cash flow of two dollars. And so we are going to say this is equal to 2 times, and I believe that first growth rate was 20%, and that's going to be equal to enter store 1. Let's go back and make sure that 20% is right, and there it is. Now they say that happens for two years, so we are going to arrow down. F01 is going to be one because no two dividends or cash flows here are going to be identical. Then we'll arrow down once more. Now this time we're going to say recall one, that brings back our D1, multiply by 1.2 equal. Enter, and I'm going to say store two, that's our dividend to amount. So now we have dividend one, dividend two. The only thing left to calculate is, divid is uh, the price at time two, which we know is dividend two times one plus the new growth rate. Let's go see if we can remember that is 5%. Very good. So we are going to say multiply by 1.05. That's actually D3 right there, but we're not going to worry about that because we are merely going to divide by R minus G2. R here is 0 0.10 minus 0 0.05 close parentheses equals. That means that this stock is worth $60.48 at time two. But we have to remember that we also have the dividend to, we need to add back. And so we'll say plus recall two. Now why are we doing that? Because we're gonna collect that dividend and then immediately thereafter sell the stock for its price at time two. And we will hit enter. And so now I have C0, C01, and C02 in here. I want to find the sum of the present values of all those things. Well, it turns out the NPV key does exactly that. It gives you the sum of the present values of all the cash flows that are in the CF key worksheet. And so the required return here is 10. Now this is the only place in which we will be using a full percentage number instead of the decimal equivalent. So don't get freaked out by that. We're gonna arrow down 
and then compute. And when I do that, I see that this stock should be selling for $54.55. That's what this means. The sum of the present values of all the future cash flows of the stock is $54.55. Now, would it matter whether people tended, intended to sell the stock after 10 years or 20 years or one year? Absolutely not. This stock is worth exactly the same to all these people because when you sell it, you sell it for the present value of all the dividends beyond that date. And so it's always going to be this way. That's why it's okay to only have one stock market and one stock price because each share of stock is worth exactly the same amount to everybody who is in the market.